Yes. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Thomas Harms. I'm uh, from Bremen in Germany. And um, I'm very happy that you're here and um, following our first talk here in the series of what we call Global Empathy. Um, global Empathy wants to be something bringing people together um, who are really working in developing a global consciousness and in, as researchers, as psychotherapists, as people who are really trying to overcome our universal crisis. It's a global crisis we're in and we're really on the edge and on our planet, I would say. And um, my idea was really that um, after doing that, like more than 25 years working with newborn babies and parents, um, really searching and um, for something what I can offer to, to do something in, in this situation, especially in the last months, I was very much concerned with that. So, and I'm very convinced that um, the work with babies and parents, what I've done the last 25 years and more, is a very important piece for this to, to get a better word, I would say, and to do something to create what I call an emotional climate change and in a change of an inner ecology. And um, so that was my, my idea, meeting, talking with people uh, who are really doing something in this, in this field. So I'm very, very happy that we talked in, the first, in this first evening with Matthew Appleton, he's from Bristol, he's a baby therapist, and I know him now for many years already, and we were working closely together. And I'm very happy because I think his work is important. And what I like in Matthew's work is that he is integrating so many fields of research and also work itself in therapeutic approaches in his baby therapy approach. So hello, Matthew, and it's great that you're here and that we have the opportunity to, to talk this evening about your work and especially about this new book. It is called um, Transitions to Wholeness. And it's a very, very nice uh, book, what you have written, and you collected lots of your backgrounds there and, and the fields of your research. And I would like to talk the next 60 minutes about that with you and um, to give an, an overview maybe what, what's, what's your work about and what you're touching and why it's maybe also so important for our whole discussion. Matthew, hello. Hi, Thomas. It's, and thank you for your well, thank you for the opportunity. I, I really appreciate your generosity in, in working to make this happen. And, and this, the idea of emotional climate change, is, that's, a, that's a, a really beautiful concept. I haven't heard you say that before. So uh, that's lovely. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to our discussion. And, uh, and I do want to also say thank you to everyone who's turned up this evening. There's some, I had a quick look at the at the gallery view and there are some familiar faces and not so uh, familiar faces uh, but yeah thank you for taking this time to join us. Okay uh, so we are taping this talk um, and we have a maximum in the, in today we have a maximum guest um, of, of 100 participants and so I, I guess could be some more people that we have booked out in the moment. So if other people want to come in, they have to share later with us. And we are in the moment still very low budget. So <laughs> we do my best technically and personally. So, so let's start. Okay, Matthew, I, um, let's start about your work, Integrative Baby Therapy, mm -hmm. which is covering so many different fields. And um, first of all, I wanna, wanna start with the personal thing. So because when you started, and you were mentioning that in your book, and very often personally, uh, you were working as a house father in Summerhill School. It's a very open-minded, democratic school in England, founded by A.S. Neal. And 
So my first question is, why was that experience so important for you for your later baby work, working with children and adolescents? Well, I'm just, first of all, remembering that's where we first met in Berlin in, oh, long time ago, <laughs> when I was talking about Summerhill then. And uh, I think you were just beginning to dive into the baby work then. And I mean, there were so many different aspects to this. And one of these was that, that Summerhill began as an experiment to try to understand the nature of the child. You know, what, what is child nature if we don't mold it in a particular way? And so uh, I, this, this whole concept really grabbed me. And I, I lived with, uh, I lived in the Summerhill community for more than, well, around about nine years. And uh, I saw children go through many different processes as they decompressed from the conventional educational system and then started to become more themselves to, to, to be able to soften, open up, relax, be more at home with themselves. And of course, A.S. Neil, who was the founder, he, he started to get interested in babies mainly through his contact with Wilhelm Reich. And I'd read uh, Neil's book, The Free Child, which, which is the one that deals most with this, and then began to read more about uh, Reich's work with children. And this just really grabbed me. And there were several other seminal books for me, like uh, David Boadella's book on, uh, on live streams, and uh, Ashley Montague, Touching. The, the, these, these books really began to open up the yeah, this field of curiosity, and I became a father. That that helped, <laughs> and uh, so my my main interest was well, in the same way that Summerhill was looking at what's child nature without this, these kind of cultural imprints. What, what? Let's go back even further. You now, what? Because it's because the baby is where human nature really meets culture. Okay, and what? I mean, you were expressing that also in your, in your book. I mean, that you learn quite a lot about self-regulation. I mean, that how the baby, how the child is expanding, that they came very stiff in the beginning, very armored, you say. Um, so they were totally repressed, suppressed, uh, feel, suppressing their feelings. And then you saw this change and that that was something you, you later found again in the baby work. I mean, there was a general universal change in the human being. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it's, it's what, what, what the, I would say is central is what's the living principle in each of us? What's the living principle that the baby brings to the world? What is a baby? I mean, just to start with a fundamental question, what is a baby? How often do we ask that question? What is baby? What's the, what's the living principle? And, and what, I, what I began to, well, look, my way into the work with, with babies was initially through craniosacral work. And then I began to see babies were communicating things that I was not getting. And that led me to study more. I studied uh, with Carlton Terry, uh, uh, an American pre and perinatal therapist who was then working in Switzerland. And, and so it, I began to then get more clarity around what babies were expressing, what, what that, that actually they were, uh, many babies were still really cycling in their birth experience. They, they, and, and in that sense, they weren't fully present. They, they were kind of part of them was still caught up in an unintegrated part of their journey to, to get here. And so at the same time, I was, I was working with adults where I was seeing the, these same, we call imprints, these birth imprints or prenatal imprints were functioning in people's lives in, in, in a very unconscious way. So, so part of, part of where, where I feel really privileged to have been able to, to do this work is to be working with the babies on the one hand and then working with the adults on the other hand and seeing how from both sides 
there's, there, there's, a, there's an aspect of human experience that's really in our shadow, which needs to be opened up and explored. Was there any personal thing which attracted you getting to the baby? I mean, it's in a way also unusual as a, as a young man starting working with babies in that time already, like 25, 30 years ago. I mean, was there any, anything in you where you would say, okay, that has to be the baby? I think it, I think it was a, it was it was a little bit of a of a meandering journey in that way. I mean, I mean part part of I loved working at Summerhill. That that was something which was was really important for me, and I got so far with that. I, I knew I had to make a change, and I knew that I couldn't work with children in the conventional system. So for a while, I was I was I was a little lost there. Okay, what 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 do I need to do now? Where, where, where do I need to go with this? And, and then when I began to work with the babies, the cranial work, I think, I think perhaps the thing that really pulled me in was that deep contact. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, a, there's a very, uh, I came across a beautiful quote by uh, Lawrence van der Post, who uh, you may be familiar with. He was a writer who lived with the Kalahari people in, in, the, in, the, in South Africa was a close friend of Carl Jung. And he said something really beautiful which resonated for me. He said, a newborn baby is older than a teenager. And what he, what he, what he, what he means here is, is the newborn baby is in contact with something really ancient, something that goes back, you know, through the generations, the, the, the collective, we may say there. And, and, and that really made sense to me. It's like the baby is in contact with something that we've lost contact with. Okay. And, and so it's the babies, just, just being with the babies, feeling that contact, getting curious. Mm -hmm. So this deep wish and this deep search for the deep and true contact maybe is something we're looking for. And when I, when I was looking to your book and you were mentioning that you were, let's say in this baby work, there was another thing what I also see again and again in your work and also personally that you really, a lot of, uh, that you really try to integrate very different ideas, working areas, research fields. And we could say in the baby work, we really need a lot of different styles of work. We have to work integrative, we need, uh, in a way, many hands, uh, as we need many hands for, to, to bring up a baby, we also need a lot of different styles of work to get a full picture. The systemic element, the work of the pre and perinatal aspect. So, and you were pointing out three different aspects or different fields which are really integrated in your work. Maybe we can start talking about that. What are these main three fields? you are putting together? Well, there's the, there is the pre and perinatal aspects as what I, what I use in the subtitle of the book is I say prenatal psychology. And, and so that, that in itself takes us very deep into to the human experience, the, the very formative experiences of what it means to be a human being, what it means to be a part of nature as well. And then the transpersonal and maybe just a little bit of history and something that I talk about in the book is a very powerful experience I had as a teenager, which I, I would say really directed the, 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 the direction of my life. It took me on a particular path. And this was when I was watching a, a TV series, which was around in the 1970s called World at War. And I think it was probably the first time that I was exposed to the images from the concentration camps. And you know, to be exposed to the images for the first time is quite shocking. And I had an experience, and, and I really want to emphasize this was an experience, it was, it was a gestalt. There was, no, there was no thought process in this, but I had this sudden ex experience that when I was seeing these faces looking through the barbed wire in the film, that what was looking through their eyes was what was looking through my eyes. Mm. It, was a, it was a knowing, it was not a thought, it was a knowing. And then it, later on, I, I can't remember if it was in the same program or maybe a later episode, I, I saw that they, they, they had the Nazi youth doing all the 
exercises there. And the same thing happened. I just knew that what was looking through their eyes was what was looking through my eyes. And this took me into a big crisis. And, and we could say it was a spiritual crisis, a kind of existential spiritual crisis. And this is one, one thing that I, I see with a lot of people these days, that they're in massive spiritual crisis. What, what's, what's meaningful for me? You know, what, what, what's, what's, what's real here? And so this took me on a particular journey where I began to work with people from different traditions because I wasn't getting the answers. I began, I began with existentialism, looking at Sartre, Camus, those people. Uh, yeah, but, you know, there were some resonances there, but it wasn't really hidden spot for me. So then I began to study with, with teachers in the Buddhist tradition and began to uh, study Buddhist psychology. And that involved, you know, reading, writing, but also it involved, you know, deep meditative practices, opening up to different states of consciousness, you know, very long retreats of working with these people. And, and I got a lot from that, but still, as, as a Westerner, there were many things in that that didn't kind of work for me. Then I began to study with indigenous people, indigenous elders, shamans. And again, I began to read around that and, uh, it began to open me up to this whole transpersonal, which is the, the transpersonal or the spiritual, if you like, that sense of being connected with not only each other, but with non-human realms in nature. It is something that we is so poorly integrated into, into Western psychology. So this, this transpersonal realm, which I also saw was touched into when I was working with adults, working with the prenatal and birth themes, felt like a really important aspect to integrate. And, and, and I have to say a tricky one for me. I have to say, I, I was a little embarrassed by it. <laughs> and no because I think it's so poorly understood and people very quickly make assumptions. Mm. You know, you have to think, oh, this is esoteric, it's bullshit. And, and, and the other thing is, of course, it, it, there's a kind of also reality to how many people function in that way. It, it's like people can get very ungrounded or very ego inflated. Mm -hmm. And of course, it also touches into uh, terms which I use in my book, which traditionally belong to theology. And of course, then we, th th that, you know, I, in that sense, I see with, with organized religion, it, it gets tricky because people assume you're talking about something, which is why I try to define things very clearly in my, in, in my book. And, it, and that takes me into the somatic, because this is about embodied experience. This is not about some abstract experience. It's not something out, out there. It's not about beliefs. It's not about abstraction. It's about embodied experience, the, the inner life of the body, the outer life of the body, the, the the uh, sensual experience of being in the in, in the in the world um you know i like to think this is actually quite a sensual book you know we, we can have an erotic relationship with nature mm -hmm. and so the 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 the, 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 the somatic and, and and reich's work was profoundly important for me in that and one, one of the things i mean i love i love the whole spectrum of reich's work but there gets a point where most, a lot of people go, well, he went mad there. And that's when I got most interested. That actually, you know, he talks about, he talks about these profoundly deep experiences mm -hmm. in, in, in a way which, which was free of the, of the more kind of, it was free of the mystical aspects that you see in, in, in many ways this is talked about. But so you that said me. Let me say one. Ask me your one question. I mean, you said that you were that you were very much influenced by Reich's work, Willem Reich's work. So, on the one hand, from the somatic psychotherapy, which where he's still one of the major founders of that tradition. On the other hand, that his later work, which is very much connected with the life life science, life energy science. And I think this is very much connected to that, what you're talking, the spiritual field, the transpersonal field. And, um, but in Reich's field, it was very, he, he was very cautious, I would say. And he was, 
doubting a lot when there was this spiritual area maybe also that could be an idea that you were a little bit uh, confronted with this new field i mean there were not not so many people in the reichian field really invading in the spirituality and, and, and what i hear it, it really attracts you very much and it is connected with the baby field scene yeah yeah and and and, and really you know what, what i've tried to integrate in this book comes from many years of, of, of trying to trying to find where all the different aspects come together in a, in a cohesive way and and that was that was a, that was a lot of internal turmoil in that a lot of internal struggle in that it, it wasn't wasn't an easy uh and it wasn't an easy path in a sense so you could say when, when i hear that that it's the depths in the in the baby the depths in the in the deep contact the depths in this cultural element to, to reaching down to to deeper ground so this, this is the, the strong tendencies coming to together like streamings meeting maybe in the baby which is integrating all these different things yeah, in the work yeah and 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 in nature as well you know that that the, the we can have this deep contact with nature but 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 we need to be we need to be connected with deeply with our own inner nature to feel that deep connection with external nature. And, and that again is why I think this is an ecological issue because we, we, we can talk theoretically about what's going on in the environment, but, but when, you, when you really feel it, mm. then you're more invested in it because you feel it. Mm -hmm. So let's maybe start also with this transpersonal aspect in the baby work because okay. I think it's very essential theme in your style of work. Um, it's, it's touching the question, where do we come from? Mm -hmm. It's like a materialistic world and unmaterial world and it's in transition state. So we come from somewhere and you're discussing that a lot in your, in your, um, in your talks and in, in your articles this aspect of yeah where, what is the early ground where we where we embody and where we start embodying can you tell us a little bit why is it so important for your baby work and how are we how's the appearance of these themes in the baby work with the, with the baby itself and the therapy so well again there's the 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 the, the there's seeing it from 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 working with adults and then seeing it from from working with the babies and 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 so I'm inf informed by both aspects to that, but 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 I think the first thing I want to say is, is that we can never fully understand where we come from. I think that that's so important to hold the mystery in it. And there's a lovely term that the Lakota people in North America use. use. They, they 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 talk about wakantanka. And it means, it's often translated as the great spirit, but actually it, it, it translates as the great mystery. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, we, we have to understand that when we begin to engage with the baby, we, we're standing on the shore of a great mystery. So let's be humble about it. Let's, let's, let's you know, let's, let's open to that and, and, and not, not put all this, all this nonsense on the baby, this, this, this kind of very reductionist approach to the baby. And that's one of the things that I, I, I think is very central to the word. The, the baby is objectified. We are objectified. But if we, if, if we come from the transpersonal perspective, we recognize that consciousness is, is there from the beginning. Consciousness is primary. In, 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 uh, we, we, we see this now in, in this, there, there, are new, there, there are many new ideas coming up around the old animistic ideas, which are really fascinating. And we have panpsychism as well. We're beginning to look at the way that trees communicate. And far, we're starting to see this interconnection, and which, which is grounded in some pristine quality of consciousness. Now, we, we with our particular paradigm here, we, 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 we put consciousness as, a, as an epiphenomenon of the brain. We, that's how it's understood. It's a result of uh, uh, electrical, chemical interactions in the brain. Now, th this, is, this, this is an idea which is really just goes back 300 years. And, and for, 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 for the whole of the rest of humanity, this has not been the understanding. 
Now, I, I would say there are advantages to that understanding, but there are great losses. And one of those is that the baby becomes objectified uh, prenatally uh, as a, biolog a, a series of biological processes, later on as a series of biological reflexes. All of that is true, but it's not the end of the story. If we can see there is consciousness there from the very, very beginning, and that consciousness is, and, and, and the biological processes are informing each other, then we regard the baby in a completely different way. So mm. taking that to having this, you starting, let's say, with a, there is something that's a big consciousness and also the experiential um, studies and where, where clients are talking about very, very early experiences, you can trace them back really to this very, very early beginning. So that is something. So it's a question. There's no nervous system. There's no structure which is carrying that. So what is going on there? It's just, it's just speculation. And it's, there are hundreds and thousands of reports where something is going on in this very early biosocial, very early biosocial environment. So and there's one thing you were really structuring in a way the um, let's say a different you 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 try to find a differentiation between something very deep what you call the ground it's like mm -hmm. the you're talking about the soul and you're talking about the ego and from the beginning on this development starts maybe you can connect this whole conscious deba debate with that with your theory what you put put together there yeah I mean one 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 point of clarity there is to say that I, I, I don't talk about the soul, I talk about soul, and I, I, I'm very careful to do that, uh, bec because it, it, what we're working here with is, is, is people's subjective experience. So it, it's their inner experience. So it's not a thing, it's, it's more of, a, as you say, an essence, a process. And also, as you say, that there, there are phenomenal studies uh, which are emerging now, which are surely going to be part of new paradigm. We see this. It's like it's like um, it's like new shoots appearing through the earth, new shoots of, of of awareness, which are being backed up by science. And we're also seeing it at the other end of life, which is where we begin to you know the, the people are actually starting to study the near death experience in a completely different way. And so things that until recently were regarded as being, well, really weird, we're not going to go there. Now scientists are beginning to understand. They're looking at, looking at consciousness, looking at fields of information, looking at energetic processes. There's a lot more, uh, a lot more if you like, uh, theoretical research work to back up what we're actually discovering in, the, in, in our work. Now, when, when I've worked with adults in, in, in workshops and in private practice, people have reported processes which, unless they're undercover embryologists who are, you know, sneaking into the workshops, they're describing profound uh, awareness of embryological processes. And so, how could that happen? And one of the fascinating things there is, is people have often described things which didn't fit with the, with the science, but then later on, the science shifted. And like, okay, it actually backs up what we were seeing. Can you make an example of that? Yeah, I mean, a really obvious example, well, a really good example, if we're going to go right back to the beginning, is where we, we talk about, in, in my work, the way I describe it is archetypal biological matrices or templates and the, these are related to very early cellular experiences uh, and, and the way that information is encoded in cells is in itself fascinating and, and one, of, I mean, one of the difficulties about this work is you know we're touching into lots of fields which in themselves you know we're not experts in but there's there's there's, there's you know we can see something happening here because you can't be an expert in all these different fields but one of, the, one, one of the things that we found was in our workshops, when it came to working with conception themes, people experienced that the egg grabbed the sperm. 
Now this, this was not the conventional idea. And, uh, and then, no, well, sorry, at that time, it was very much, you know, the sperm comes in and it penetrates and, and you know, it's all, it's all, it was all very, in a sense, patriarchal in viewpoint. But what we began, what, what, what we were seeing in the workshops, then we saw the researchers coming out. They were studying, they found actually the egg. <coughs> yeah, it grabs the sperm. It, it chooses the sperm, the orients towards a particular sperm. We were seeing all this. Vanishing twin syndrome is another one. I mean, when I first started the uh, work, I thought this is crazy stuff. You know, vanishing twins, people in the womb, there was a twin there, they disappeared and uh, people are reporting this experience. And, and uh, you know, I have to say that you know, I've, I've always been, I hope, a healthy skeptic, <laughs> rather, than, rather than just accepting everything or being cynical, I've been a healthy skeptic. But when you see these processes happening again and again, you have to take them seriously. And then the research comes, ah, oh, yes, very often, uh, you know, it's, I can't remember the exact figure now, but it's quite high, it's, it's almost half uh, of, of, of pregnancies, there is a twin that then disappears later on and parents don't even know it was there. So those are a couple of examples. So, but this exactly is these scenes, let's say the conceptual scenes. So, so if an unborn being is not invited or it's, a, it's, it's in, so the conception has, has been in a very violent field, ha happened in a very violent field. I mean, let's say a classical, infant researcher he would say it's bullshit i mean what you're talking and um, there's no way to talk about this stuff there's no evidence for that so but now when you work with a baby i mean when you have something like a baby who's unwanted who wasn't there was no real intake to come on come here i mean what is the baby directly concrete showing us what is, what is that, what you see in what you call in the baby body language, for example, where you get evidence, there's a connection between the narrative, between the story, the baby story, and these very, very early imprintings, these very early experiences the baby had. So what is connection? And why would you say we have to look to that, although it's not embedded in our materialistic, mechanistic worldview? Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in that sense, again, th th this is a good example of how a particular cultural viewpoint can diminish uh, a, a, a child, a, a newborn's experience of being welcomed and prenatally being welcomed into the womb. Absolutely. And, and um, the, ba the body language, what we see, see, and again, and coming back to the idea of these, these are archetypal biological matrices and this, this this is this is this is a concept i haven't really come across in in in, in this way elsewhere because 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 of course these are archetypal cellular experiences and we what we see is these cellular experiences are, are repeated at the level of the organism and, and and one of the for example one one uh situation where we often see this is with uh, IVF babies, where they're, they're, we can say there's been a lot of conception trauma, mm -hmm. a lot of invasive, uh, a lot of invasive processes, a lot, a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot going on there in the field, let's say, of that baby's experience. And the baby show us? Sorry? What would, would the baby show us around that? So it, well, that is something I, I got, I mean, that what I know is, it's a really, it is embedded in the whole matrix. This is embedded in the plasma system. And it's, it is a kind of expression which is, which is still in the body, it's an imprinting. So what, what would happen? I mean, this is very fascinating. There's maybe no, ner there's definitely no nervous system. And the system is carrying, just in the beginning, some information in expressing that in the moment the baby has a chance to to repeat to to re, to recapitulate that yeah yeah it reminds me a little bit of uh, i saw your interview with will davis and uh, very, very seen some very nice resonances there and he talked about the plasmatic system and how that's an information system and of course you know that's there in the cell 
and and within the cells we have we have structured water water holds memory mm -hmm. and, and 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 the whole plasmatic system functions like uh, like crystals it, it's it's liquid crystalline structure and and if you look at the work of people like james oshman uh, a biophysicist or may Wan ho a physicist it's beautiful beautiful work about about how this functions and then there's also uh, work by Thomas Verney, who has done a lot of work into the nature of how cells hold experience, how it's encoded at the level of DNA, how it's uh, uh, encoded in proteins. Uh, I know he's, he's about to publish a, a new book, which I think will be fascinating. So, so, so we, we, we need to look at cells in a different way. We need to look at how information is held in a different way. And, and literally, we can see sperm-like movements, and there's, there are other other movements related to the to the uh, the ovum, the egg cell that we see held at the level of the organism. Now, now we worked with these, and what we see is when we work with uh, supporting the child to integrate the experience with with uh, with you know real presence and contact and empathy then the, the body language begins to disappear mm -hmm. because, because it doesn't need to be there. You don't need to keep telling the same story once it's integrated. And, and so, sorry, just, just, just to say that a lot of behaviors we see, I, I'm now referring back to the IVF babies where they say, oh, you know, they, later on they were diagnosed, you know, hyperactive disorder, things like that. But actually what we're seeing is, is the, these resonances with these very early disturbances around conception, and they can be worked with. But that means, so when, it, when this very early living system is implanted in, the, in this cold environment, let's say a mother who is, let's say, threatened, has, is carrying a lot of traumatization, is living in a biosocial environment which is very rejecting and so on so and now these very little so this in these very early stages of life so I, when i understood you right this this plasmatic system is contracting and is mm -hmm. losing the natural rhythm and pulsation as a reaction to this cold environment just in the beginning so you, you could say just on the edge from the one world to the other, in the embodiment already, the system can contract and carry on this antisocial experience. And when I understood it right, that a baby, for example, has still this experience and wants to bring it out or coming back in the old potential, coming back into old pulsatory process. That is something very essential in your, in your understanding, I think. So what, what are we doing there? So what, are we inviting the baby? Do we asking the baby, come on, show me this? <laughs> or what, what are we doing? We could also say we're just working on the connective tissue level, on the plasmatic level, what like an osteopath is doing. What I see is you're doing more. You want also the information out of the body. So. Well, well, yeah, I mean, this, and this is a really interesting, this is a really interesting edge because I, as I mentioned, I started to work with uh, babies with through the craniosacral work, which is really working at the bioplasmatic level. And so I was getting good results with uh, the, you know, what I was doing. But again, there was still something I was seeing. I mean, it worked for some children to a large degree, but not for all, all of them. And so when I work with the baby, I mean, first of all, I, I, I do want to give the context that we always work with the baby as part of a system. You know, we don't work with the baby in isolation. So we're working with the parents. We're helping the parents to get curious about what might be going on. Because, because of course, if, if, if the baby is cycling in distress and it's not being, let's say, a, appropriately met, then the parents begin to cycle with distress. So very often when you get a family in, as you well know, everyone's cycling in distress. We need to start to create some connection with self before we can connect with other. And so that's what we do. We work with the parents, work with what they need to bring so that they can be, they can have a container of, of, of a capacity to be with the baby. 
And, and so then it's like, yeah, what have you got to show me? You know, just open up that space. And a, ter a term I, I, I love, I mean, it's so central to my work, is from Winnicott, the potential space. Potential space is so, so important in this. And, and, and I'm, not sitting there, I'm not sitting there kind of analyzing. I'm not sitting there with any other expectation other than what, what story might you have to, to, to tell us? What, what, you know, what do you need to happen here? So it's very much led then by the baby. And so the baby is very often when you hold that potential space, and you, again, it, it has to be embodied. You have to be present. So you could, there can be an, uh, an embodied resonance with the baby. Then the baby, the babies feel that they begin to, through the baby body language, tell the story. And then let's say something is starting and that could also be these very, very early issues. Let's say mm -hmm. this rejection, this coldness, this, so from the very early time of life. And how are you putting that together? I mean, how are you integrating that? There's one time, on the one hand, the story of the parents. I mean, maybe they remember how it was in the beginning and how they were in stress or how they struggled or how they were fighting. Could be that on the one hand. On the other hand, there's a baby in the slowness, in this field and without expectations. And now suddenly something is arising. And how are you putting the pieces together that we get a full picture and a full story? How, how is that happening? Well, to a, to a large degree, something very intelligent happens in the process. And uh, there's a lovely term from a cranial osteopath, one of those old cranial osteopaths, and I really love those osteopaths. I mean, again, they're, they're so in, the, they're so in the, this, this kind of territory. Uh, Roland Becker, an American uh, osteopath, he used to term the inherent treatment plan. And he talked about how working with the body, how when we begin to engage with the body, and very often in a gentle way, the treatment plan unfolds. And this happens with the, in, in the relational field. And for me, this was my big discovery, that actually what was happening, what was, what was in a very intelligent process happening in the organism also happens in the social organism, the relational field of the family. And so it's very, much, it's very much, okay, we're listening to the story, we're seeing what the baby's showing. I always try and get the parents curious. I want to get them interested in the story. And again, this is, this is something beautiful. Well, it can be, it can be tricky too, but, it, but uh, because, because very often parents come with the idea there's something wrong. You know, the baby's got trauma. And I'm going to quote another old osteopath, the founder of osteopathy, uh, Andrew Taylor. Still, he said, anyone can find disease. The real physician needs to find health. Mm -hmm. and, and, and beautiful thing here is in the story, there's the health. There's the baby pushing to, to self-regulate, to find the pulsation again, to, to be able to expand out. And, and then... And again, I mean, just to refer to what, what Will was saying last time, it's, it's not just expanding that, it's about coming back to the self as well. It's about you know, both aspects of that. And so it's the chronic contraction. It's, it's, it, it's the imprint of the cold womb, if you like. The analogy I use in the book is it's like a glass of water. I think I use it in the book. If you add a dye, it colors the water. And so it's like the baby's experience is being colored by this early trauma. And it's also secondary trauma because the baby needs us to understand. And if we're not understanding, it breaks down the trust between the baby and the parent or the baby in the environment. You know, if I'm trying to tell you, Thomas, you know, I've had such a hard day today, and you say, oh, Matthew, oh, shh, shh, shh. it's okay. You know, I'm not going to feel so happy. Or, or if you tell me, you know something, I think you should go and have something to eat. Probably your blood sugar levels. I go, but, but Thomas, I need to tell you about this. It, it, it's like, I would lose trust in our relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and the same for the baby with the parents. And it's not the parents' fault because nobody's told them about any of this. So there's a secondary trauma. There's a loss of trust. And then the parents lose trust in themselves. 
the whole bonding process becomes disrupted. So there are different levels. So we, if we can get the empathic resonance between, you know, for the parents, first of all, with themselves, then with the baby, then everything works its way through in a kind of the inherent treatment plan. We're working with the health, we're working with the emergent properties within the potential space. And it can go many different ways. Sometimes we may have to stop the process, pay attention to the parents. You know. so, so maybe when I would pick that up, I mean, yeah. let's say you, you were talking about Will Davis's talk. I mean, let's say, and he's, he's very related to the late research from Willem Reich. And he said, like, he was also already talking about the, this plasmatic system of the unborn baby in the womb, which is contracting. And he, he's pointing out, okay, it's okay when the energy starts to radiate and pulsate again, we don't need necessarily the story. It's mm -hmm. just, just the baby has to start back, coming back in his rhythm. What you're saying now is it's very important putting these two pieces together, it's biological activation, the biological activity, the pulsation, but when that opens up, then the old story is also open up and it is very important that we get an empathic understanding what the baby is showing us. Yeah. Is that right? That's right. So, so, so in that sense, we're not just follow. I mean, and this is an important point, you know, if, if you get focused on the story in an abstract way, if you get focused on the uh, baby body language, it, just the baby body language, then you're not actually really meeting this living principle in the baby. You need to also feel the emotional tones. You know, is the baby, is the baby really scared here? Is the baby really angry? Is the baby um, very sad? Is the baby grieving? And so we, we, we mirror this back through our own tones. It's like, oh, I can see you look so sad now. Or, oh, you look really angry now. I can see how angry you are. So we match, there's a, there's a resonance there. Uh, and, and so one of, the, one of the core wounds I think most of us have is because we were not welcomed as, as conscious, exquisitely vulnerable and alive human beings, uh, we felt alone with our experience. Mm -hmm. So the emotional resonance is really important. But that, when that happened, let's say what you say, that's a sad baby, there's an angry baby. So on their parents with, with the baby, and you mirroring that emotional tone, that doesn't mean necessarily it's a prenatal aspect. So if let's say there's a lot of desperation, loneliness in the baby coming from these early roots, how are you explaining that to the parents? Are you doing that? Or are you just mirroring, let's say the expressive language, just the emotional language with, or do you, do, uh, let's say, translate that experience to the parents that they can see that? That is, I think it's a very important thing. But so what you now say is it's very important that you have this body language, which has to be met. And the cognitive aspect may be secondary, but the parents have to understand it also and to get an empathic way to get, to get it together, to say, okay, now I see the crying is connected with these very, very early issues of the birth, within the birth, before the birth. So how are you bringing that together? It, uh, I mean, it's, it's tricky for many different reasons. I mean, partly because parents may feel very guilty, particularly moms may feel very guilty, and that, that's, that's, that's really tough. And in that sense, again, I, I, I want to look systemically, and I, and I always try to frame it systemically, that you know, we put a lot of moms, we put too much on moms, but actually you know, there are systemic failings that often mean that moms are struggling. So, so always I try to come back to the systemic. And, and, and I try to give as little information as possible. I try, I try to find what's the important thing, what could be really important for these parents in this particular session to get about their baby's experience. 
And there are times as well where, again, I know, I know you know this, but, but we, we have to support the baby to complete a process. It's not simply a matter of mirroring. We may need to help them complete a birth process by bringing in contacts to their heads, to their feet, where they complete a process. And it's beautiful when they do that because they move from what we call learned helplessness to feeling empowered. So it, it, it's, I always try to get a sense of where, where are the parents? What, 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 what are their reference points? And then I always open it up with an inquiry. And, and so one of the things I often say when I teach the work is if you ever get the feel, if you ever get the sense of you want to give some information, see how you can turn it into a question. Mm -hmm. I wonder, could your baby feel, maybe feeling something from the birth? Or no, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, do you think maybe, you know, when your baby was in the womb, they, they, they may have experienced, you know, whatever, you know. But, uh, uh, and very often, very often people will get it. If you, if you, if you open it up, you know, do you think? They start to, because it doesn't create the resistance. You're not saying it is this. It's definitely this. Not an interpretation, like in a psychoanalytic way. It's more making the person more curious and open up for this, let's say, this field, this energetic and emotional field, what the baby is exp uh, expressing. So that's how they would understood. Absolutely. And, 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 and another, another thing I often say to students is that, that there are three levels. Of, of, of information that, that, that we can pick up on this work. One is through very specific body language. And it is a very specific language based on archetypal experiences. We can get pretty clear what this baby is showing. This is an important thing. Maybe we can go on a little bit about that because it's time is running maybe. So especially about the baby body language, something we were talking already about it, but also when we see the baby wants to complete this unfinished business and the baby wants to show us, look, that was the main thing where I was stuck in my continuum of development. Yep. Yes. So let, let's talk about that. How important is that to understand that for us, for a therapist, and also maybe for us as a culture? So it's a blind spot, as we say. Well, it, it is really important because where, where we have those gaps, those gaps live in us. They, 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 and, and, you know, that's often where we have our own personal blind spots too, because we, we organize around those gaps. We, we organize around those places of, of helplessness. And, and, and having, again, worked with adults, seeing how, um, how, it, how, powerful these early experiences are you know because 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 for most of us at least for for our generations in our cultures you know we we haven't experienced the 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 the, the traumas of, of war or famine in, in 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 our lives i mean there are epigenetic aspects to that which we are holding for sure but we haven't experienced it directly you know the pandemic is probably for for most of us the, the 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 most traumatic big global experience that we've we've had to face and of course we all with the climate change too but the places where our survival where we felt our survival was threatened mostly was very early because we're totally dependent on the other and we're totally dependent on the other to regulate our stress levels and, and, and so it, it, it's, it's from the baby's perspective, and this, I think this is really important, the experience may be, I might die here. And we know this even from, you know, babies who are left to cry on their own. They, they, they fall into an experience of, of, of existential awfulness, which, which shows up as a kind of internal sense of, of the abyss later on. I live in an abyss. So it, it, it's the, these are powerful imprints, which really we hold at a psychosomatic level, uh, which is, it's essential for us, not only in terms of, of working with many crises we have in, 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 in psychotherapy, somatic issues too, but also to change. So we need to change the civiliza civilization by changing the way we welcome babies in.
you know, this is Reich said, this statement, civilization will start when the, the newborn is the most important. That this, this, that statement was like, yes, that, 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 that went right in even before I was doing the baby work. And it's been a profound kind of guide, guiding principle for me. So when a baby, let's say, is getting stuck in the birth and is very threatened and there's a lot of fear as you're writing and expressing all over again, and there's a lot of stuff going on here, it's, it is a connection of losing the relational field between the mom and the baby. It's a lot of pain maybe mm -hmm. going on and there's a lot of contraction going on here. And it could affect the whole ocular system uh -huh. so that the baby afterwards is not interested anymore in the world to make an open eye contact, to, to reach out pleasurable into the world. So there are deep effects on the, from the birth to the later on social engagement system of, of the baby. So, and I'm curious now, coming back to the work, what would you say is the important part, especially about these birth traumas? There's so many aspects about that. We could talk hours and hours about that. But what would you say from your philosophy? What is the main aspect to restructure that so that the baby coming back in a good potential? So what is the big, is it the re, so repeating? Is it the coming back into place, into relationship? Is it to be seen? What is it? What, it? what is the relief? Where is the relief and the release is coming from? Well, I, I think the, ma the, major, the major relief is from I'm not alone in this experience. There's, there's a lovely term, I can't remember the name of the, the author now, uh, a trauma writer in the Jungian tradition who talks about feeling felt. We need to feel felt. This is very much a, a left, uh, sorry, a right hemisphere to right hemisphere resonance as well. And this is one of our problems. We're so left brain in our culture. And, and this beautiful work again with uh, Alan Shaw and uh, you know, the right hemispheric psychotherapy. So, so it's like this, this emotional resonance, it's this, this, this connection I think is the, the most important thing. It reconnects. And, and again, this connects in with the transfer, transpersonal because when the, when, the, when, when the mom disappears, it's like the universe disappears. It's like, a, you know, that the whole world becomes kind of existentially threatening. It's like, there's nothing there. I'm on my own. I'm, I, I'm, in, I'm in this abyss. I'm dying. It's a, it, it, and again, this is, this is something we see indigenous cultures deal with this whole, uh, death, birth, death, rebirth theme. They, they, they work with it instinctively. We've lost this. So to actually be present, is, is, this is, this is the, the essence of the work. And then there are the different parts which may be to, to support the baby. For example, a, ba a baby touches the same place on their cranium again and again. It's where they got stuck. They feel helpless. We make a contact. The baby pushes the hand away. This feeds back to the baby, ah, I'm not helpless. We celebrate, wow, you can do that now. Get the parents to celebrate, wow, you can do that now. The babies will go back into the position they get stuck in their birth. And when you see them, they're helpless, they're crying, they're on their own. Support them to integrate that by bringing the contact to the feet, supporting them to move forward, bringing the contact to the head so that they can feel the power, I can move forward. This, this, on all levels, this starts to integrate what hasn't been integrated. And when you say, okay, you, what you're describing is like in your work, you're empowering the baby, that, you, that the baby gets back into a, its potential to, let's say, to push away, for example, what is damaging, how it has damaged the baby. Yes. Does the baby necessarily have to express a whole... Um, negative emotions is it part of the healing process that the baby every baby has to express the this whole deep crying and the fear or can we reach directly without drama to the point of empowerment it's a big question is it is 
is our trauma work really needing this crying process and the, the whole existential fears to be met and to express or is it possible to go beyond that and open up, up the healing process well i don't I, first of all i want to say i don't i don't think i don't think of these as negative emotions the, the this, this this is a push for life and so you know if the baby what one of the ways we can understand this is that if the baby is in a frozen place we want to get the baby to be able to be present and to be socially engaged to, to to feel that 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 contact but the baby's frozen they're contracted you can't get from the one to the other without going through the anger or or, or whatever the emotion is it's mobilizing this is this is the issue it's mobilizing and, and if we can see this, I mean, very often I have these babies and they're kind of whinging. Could do a bit of work, and, and you're like, great, you know, to let the parents see this is healthy. But not every not every baby does need to do this. And sometimes I see babies doing it in a very non dramatic way. As well, this surprised me actually because in in in, in the training I had, it was like it all had to be like that. Cool that way and what i have seen and i know this is very much connected with your work as well it is when you build when you can build that kind of uh, you know, the, the 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 parent can be present they can they can they can be with their own emotions they can be in contact with the baby a lot of this can can work its way through it doesn't always need the major dramas there so i i i i've, I've seen something which 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 again it, it i i've learned more by from the babies than from all the trainings i did in a sense in the same way i learned more at summerhill from being with the children but the but but i've worked with babies where they're kind of they're touching these places and they still want to explore their story but it's like they've not got this big drama associated with it and i've always seen that there is a there is a a, a beautiful kind of emotional resonance with, with with the parents particularly with the mom there that that she 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 she's in contact mm -hmm. so maybe we put that together to another thing which is all what you're all mentioning and you also mentioning in your book and this is now related these early traumas are reducing let's say two aspects the one is the reaching out that is a pleasurable thing let's say like early sexuality and you're very much connected to rights work where let's say it's an early living movement to reach out that's a pleasure pl process and on the other side these let's early tra traumatization are also connected to the loss of let's say a resonance field or attachment field whatever you call it mm -hmm. so and you're talking a lot about these two aspects about one is the pulsation and the pleasure and on the other, other hand it is the need and the the will for for really to to be secure so attachment and sexuality that's a big issue or yep. could you say something about that because the birth trauma for example is interfering with both of the systems yes yeah so so it's it's um you know if you if you're let's imagine you're at home and you've got candles on you're having a romantic night with your partner and you're feeling in the mood and you know, soft music and all that's going on and a tiger walks in the room yeah you're probably not going to be feeling so romantic you <laughs> you know your your nervous system hopefully will be saying priority survival right now fight or flight so in a sense we can say this is the, the experience of the baby there there's there's been a a trauma there has been a, 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 a an interruption of the relational field the baby is cycling in that they need to feel safe to be able to come into the the pleasurable contact again and again if we're very contracted we don't expand out with pleasure so one of the things i've talked about in 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 the book is, is i've made a distinction and, and and this this is the way that i use the words between uh, attachment and bonding 
And in, in, in the sense I use it, the detachment is survival based, but bonding is pleasure based. And this was, this, this, this is, I, for me, it's really important. And it goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's there in the baby too. You know, but there can even be pleasure in birth as well as, as, well as the um, uh, more, more difficult aspects. I, and I do, I do also want to say that we make birth more difficult in our culture. We don't, we, we're not even working with the natural physiology of birth a lot of the time in our, in our culture. So there are cultural imprints even on that. But until the, the, the child and the parents, of course, the parents need to feel safe for there to be the pleasurable bonding. So attachment survival, then next level bonding pleasure. And so when we see that the parents and the baby both cycling into stress, you see that the, the pleasure bonding cannot be there. So it's like the tiger in the room on a romantic evening. So that means, for example, when in the baby walk, the baby has, and I saw, see that again and again in the sessions, it's just radiating and has this very pleasurable contact in the eyes or have a very lovely sucking experience. It could be an entrance for release for the baby. Yep. But on the other side, it could also come from the other side. So we're working also with the connection between the two, where the resonance field is re-established and the baby is feeling safe so let's say then the baby is sinking down is landing it's more with itself or on the other side so it's one is a more expensive aspect the other one is more the inner aspect so does it mean we can work on both sides of the position yeah ab absolutely and and there's a real sense and we we even we even have parents sometimes say my baby feels heavier. I'm sure you you know that. You know, my baby feels heavier. The baby is more in. Mm -hmm. and we need to go in to be able to come out. If we can't go in, we can't expand out. So, so when there's a chronic, chronic contraction, we're not actually in. We're, we're dissociated. We're, we're kind of somewhere else. So when the chronic contraction can release, then the baby comes more in. What, what we were saying by the in stroke so then you get the out stroke so you get the natural pulsation in and out and and that was also one of the things that i kind of really, really uh, i took from the cranial work this 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 going in this kind of arriving in gathering grounding coming into the body before you could come out so important and when we took it a step even further, how is the impact on that, what you're talking now, let's say this very early stressful experience to later on sexual experiences? How is the interrelationship of this very early pre and perinatal field and then what we are experiencing in our loving relationship? I mean, that is a very, very important thing for our whole styles of, of partnership and being together when there is not released traumatic aspect from this early time how is the how is that influencing how is that influencing the loving relationship and also the sexual relationship do you see there an interconnection totally and 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 i mean because it's such a vast subject i can only give a a, a very short answer of what i've noticed it, I and mean, because there's a, because there is the the, the relational aspect has is, is, is been uh, it, it, it's been uh, shattered in a way. It's it's so at a deep level we don't trust relationship. If we don't trust relationship, we contract, and so that's going to show up in our more intimate sexual relationships. Again, we're shifting from being in the romantic evening through to the tiger being in the room. And it may mean different, many different things for different people. We've also seen, which, which, is kind of, which is kind of interesting, that sometimes, for example, where there's a very dissociated mom or a mom who's been very drugged with medication, that the, the, the baby actually begins in the, in, in the birth to feel the, the, the mom through the contractions. So now I can feel you. It's like, I couldn't feel you, now I can feel you, but I feel you with a lot of pain. So there, there, there's, 
what we call coupling, coupling of experiences is like, when I feel mum, there's pain. When I feel love, there's pain. And that can actually lead to uh, sadomasochistic aspects in relationship as well. Uh, many, many different aspects. And again, even going back to the conception. I mean, I mean we, you know, I said in the book, and, it, and it's just such a simple thing, we all know, but we, but, but we, we don't often really take it into consideration because it's so obvious. We come into the world through the sexual act. Sexuality is there in the field of sexuality. I worked with men who were conceived by rape and their, their fear of their own sexuality is so profound that they, um, they cut off from it. They, they perceive themselves as dangerous. I worked with people from both genders conceived where there were a very strong drug or uh, alcohol imprints at conception. And they either need alcohol or drugs to come into relationship, or they begin to dissociate as if they were taking drugs when they are more sexually aroused. So there, there, there are many different variations of, of this, but the connections, you can really begin to see them. But what, let's say, that leads to the question when you have these early imprints, and they are so powerful, and they are influencing, influencing so much our loving relationships, our sexual relationships, but all what you said, it's so much embedded in our system. It's so unconscious. What can I do as a man, as a woman, except doing therapy in my daily life? What does that mean for me as a person? What does, does it help me to know could be eventually, there could be a, something very early offspring of, of denial, of, of, of trauma, of threatening. So in my daily life relationship. What, what is that? What is the benefit of that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, I mean, you've got to know it on the inside as well. I, 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 I mean, first of all, I think we need, there, there are different aspects to this. And, and, and part, of the, part of what I struggle with with this type of question, I mean, as and I know you know this, Thomas, but 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 it's like there's such a cultural blind spot. It, it's like there's so much work to be done, and and we we need more therapists who are aware of this. We need we we absolutely need them, and and that includes you know, even like massage therapists, for example, because a massage therapist can be doing massage on somebody it can trigger something. We need to bring it into awareness and we, we, we need to do the preventative work really early on. And we need to have more psychotherapists who are working in this field to support people. You know, just, just to know, well, I was, I was born in a certain way or I was conceived in a certain way. If, you don't, if, you, if you're not really working with the body in that, if you're not working with the implicit memory of that, you know, you'll make it a little bit of insight but you're not really going to make any great inroads into it. No, that, that means, but that is what you say, we need kind of body-oriented, deep-going therapies, at least, and a building of consciousness around the scenes and in our culture. And um, that, that, that brings me to the question is, is classical therapy, talking therapy, different styles of therapy, how much can we achieve with that without knowing or touching these themes? I mean, are we, I mean, there's still a lot of areas where these, these themes are not embedded at all. There's no, not at all an aspect of discussion and also the therapies. It's, I did years and years on in my therapies and there were never talked, there was never talked about this. So, what do we see? What do we see? I mean, is it just we have to go to that? It's a new century now where we open up the seam. Is it the seam of this blind spot which is open up? So, what is your vision? Yeah, I mean, a, lo a, a lot, a lot of, I mean, the 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 the, the actual term psychotherapy uh, means actually to to seal. Uh, sorry, to heal soul. A lot of a lot of 
psychotherapy is actually what we might call ego therapy. It helps people build stronger egos so that they can function in the world and, and to some degree function in a dysfunctional world. So I think there are levels of, of healing and maybe sometimes you've got to do even some of the ego work before you can do the deeper work. I, kn I know for myself, I had to develop a stronger ego before I could actually go deeper. So I don't think there's an either or in that sense, but to do the really deep work, we have to be able to work in the, uh, in, in the uh, more embodied way to actually connect in with the implicit memories to, because they're there and they're getting triggered all the time. And one of the, one of the things that I find when I work with adults is such a relief when they're exploring these early processes and they get it. That's what I do every time I leave the, the room. That's what I do when my partner does this. Boom, I get it now. I thought I was crazy because I, you know, I couldn't see where it, it came from in you know, the, 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 the conventional childhood stages of, um, of development. Although, of course, it will show up there as well. But, but to get to the root can re really, really change things at a much deeper level. Eva Reich said, and I guess also Willem Reich said, her father, is that every ongoing psycho or body psychotherapist should work for a while with babies. Why do you think it should be, it could be necessary that every person who's working in these fields with adults should at least have experience in that field? What is the benefit? What could be the benefit of that? Why do you think this is true? Well, I, I think before anybody starts to really work with babies they need to work with how their effect they've been affected and and, and it, it, again it needs to be in the body psychotherapy trains my, my 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 big passion really is that this this work gets integrated into the the whole uh body psychotherapeutic canon it's in there uh and in the psychotherapeutic world more generally but yeah, absolutely. We, if we do our own work and then we work with the babies and, 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 and like I said, the babies have been such powerful teachers and, and I've learned things from the babies. I, like I talked about the baby body language, most of the time you can see what it is, but there've been times when babies done something. I, well, I don't know what the hell's going on here. And I've learned something really powerful from that baby. So babies are great teachers as well. They, they bring us back to, to, if you like, the template of the human condition. So if, if, if therapists work with their, their own early prenatal birth themes as part of their training, it's integrated, then they begin to work with babies. I, I, I think it would be, it would change everything. And I would add, is really the baby is a carrier of this heart energy. So what I see in the training groups, what I see in the groups, in general, when I'm working there, it's open, it's, it's melting the armor. It is yeah. bringing, so Reich was very, was very cautious and he was always threatened by the idea when the newborn plastic baby, so living plasticity, when that is reaching an armored system that has to create irrational hate. I mean, it has to create irrational impulses. I would say what I see in my work is that the baby is really bringing the best, or it's, it's, it's taking out the best also from people. So baby is opening up also the heart relation and is opening up the heart energies. So in that sense, the baby is also like a synonym for for contact for with our core and contact with a deep empathy to all living systems, to ourselves, and also to nature where we started for. So maybe it could also be a truth that the baby is, a, let's say, is the integrator of everything what we have in the moment as problems in our world, because it's, it, it is, to solve that problem, we need all the other problems. Uh, uh, absolutely, no, I, I, I totally get that. And no, we, we even know that the, the parents' neurology changes to begin to uh, open up the heart. We know this, there's, there's the research there. And in the same way, of course, it does that to all of us. And the more we are exposed 
to to babies and I, and I will also say to, to children as as well I mean one of the things I, I, I really saw at Summerhill was you know how I mean, the children would really open up the heart too so it's so a babies young children here here is 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 I mean, any culture, so many people have said this, so many people have said that if, if, if the child, if, 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 and it goes right back to the baby, if they're not at the center of the culture, something's really wrong. Nelson Mandela said that, Rife said it, lots of people said it, it's true. <laughs> okay, I think this is a really good end for the talk. I mean, we could go on, but it, I think it's a good point, staying ending with this maybe, the, this culture of the future with the newborn babies in the center and the and a culture with, which is really caring for the self-regulation of this young born and a newborn child. I think that is, I would say, is very strong potential in that work and in this working area. And it is something which should be really in the core of, of our efforts to really get out of this big, big crisis we are in in the moment in our on our world and I think to protect the, the child of the future and to protect maybe also the future of the parents. I mean that's also it could it puts together it has to be put together. Well it take, takes me back to what you said because I love that term emotional climate change. I, I mean it's such a great term I'm gonna nick it from you but <laughs> I, I, I will quote you <laughs> And, and it's a bit like, you know, when climate change people are talking about planting trees. Well, we, we need to plant new seeds here in terms of, of, of the, the child. It's like, you know, the, we, we, we need to uh, reforest ourselves at that level too. So that's a beautiful term. I hope you don't mind if I quote you on that. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Thank you uh, for this talk. And I think we take a little, the last, it's now 50 minutes on. And um, so maybe for some questions from the people, so Please. you can put on your microphone when you want to say that something and ask Matthew something. And please, after you said something, close down your microphone again, otherwise it's getting too noisy. So who wants to say something? You can just open your microphone and I do it on the gallery. Maybe you want to talk about that. Any questions? Just greetings. <laughs> Hello from Germany to all those lovely people I see here. <laughs> greetings back, Tim. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the heart field. Yeah. <laughs> you are always there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe you want to share something, it could you also not, must not necessarily question, could also be something, yeah. some thought you have. I hope I haven't put everyone to sleep. Okay, it could also be that uh, <laughs> we're just uh, very happy with how it is and is um, fulfilled or um, there's no Nothing to uh, go on. Please. Could I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, I'm Nick Conneman. I'm from Rotterdam in the Netherlands and I work with prematurely born children as a neonatologist. So I'm working in a very aggressive environment where both parents and babies are, to my idea, violated on a daily basis. Um, within this environment, I'm trying to reach out and teach people empathy how would you go about teaching empathy to people who are much afraid of their own feelings and, you know, the, the nurses and doctors? I mean, I'm desperately trying and trying to find some way where I can plant a seed of empathy with these, my coworkers. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, yeah, first of all, you know, all, all respect to you to be working in that environment and uh, you know a lot of uh, people come on our trainings who work in similar environments and 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 have similar struggles so so I, I really get it and and I think it is it is little by little it, it, you know sometimes 
small things can make a difference. But uh, uh, modeling it, I think, is, 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 is the best way just to model it. Talk to the baby. You know, talk, talk, talk to the parents as well, but, you know, open up to, to, I'm sure you do that, you know, to, to the human level that you can within that environment. But, but modeling the contact with the babies. But I think, Matthew, this could also be just what um, Nick was asking, mostly, what are we doing with sometimes in a professional field where sometimes a lot of resistance to see something, like, let's say, to not sharing this empathic view on the baby, or maybe when you see there's a lot of rejection for that. I mean, how can we train that? I, I heard that. I mean, I mean, modeling is one. But what what can we do? And I, I think it has to be be done already in the training programs for for the in. For the medical doctors, I would propose that every medical doctor, every mid midwife, should do experiences around the birth issues. It should be part of our training programs that everyone has to, at least a little, get a taste if they, they want to get the opportunity to work in that on on these themes, and and it should be part of the curricula. That would be my my proposal maybe to, that we have on the conceptual level the representations that we have in our learning books, but they're also on a very practical and like experiential level that it should be embedded in our training programs where we work with people. Well, Thomas, you're, you touch on a point where uh, 20 years ago when I was still working in Boston uh, with young students, we would actually have them meet a baby and uh, with consent of parents would allow them to feed the baby. And I was stunned at the fact that most of the students who had been to Harvard, Yale, all over the place, you know, did lots of humanic, humanistic work, and but they had never actually fed a baby and they'd never held a baby. And as much as I agree with, yes, we model, I mean, I try to model, but it's like modeling to blind people or modeling to closed hearts. And, and so I think it's a very deep layer of, of being afraid for most people. And there's a lot of power struggles going on, even with a baby, you know, it's, it's incredible. And, and trying to break through that, it's, it's daunting. And yes, there are some results and, and I cherish those, but I mean, I want more results. <laughs> I understand I mean, uh, totally, absolutely. Yeah. And, Sorry, go on, Thomas. Yeah. I, I mean, I, absolutely, I really understand your frustration. And, 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 and to some degree, I think we have to recognize that the, the love institutions around the birth have institutionalized trauma. And a lot of people who are attracted to them as well are also attracting in, in, in response to some trauma within them. So they are taking control of the situation because of their own trauma. So of course, I absolutely 100% agree with what Thomas is saying there, that we need to get it into the programs. We need to psychotherapy programs, midwifery programs, obstetrics. This, this, is, this, is, this would be great. And the more we can get the work out there, the better. But in the situation that you're talking about, Nick, I think it, it is very, very hard. And I don't think there are easy answers to that. I mean, having references to try and open up people bit by bit, you know, you can refer them to articles, you can refer them to books and things like that. Of course, we can do that. But there is this resistance. And, 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 and certainly, certainly, I don't think we can push against that resistance. We need to find ways to melt the resistance, and, and that's drop by drop. Okay, thank you. Thank you. An important question. Maybe even one other question. Let me come to one, two other ones. I like uh, to ask something. Um, it's about a practical thing 
um, working with babies now in, in the corona time um, because I learned in the training with Matthew uh, you have to mirror the baby um, but now the problem is do I wear a mask or not and you can I, I, I'm aware that you can mirror also in your emotion your voice your energy so I don't think it is um, um, how do you say uh, um, it, it's not a barrier it, 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 to to wear a mask because some parents ask uh, ask to wear it and some are okay when you have a certain distance how how do other therapists work in this baby that okay so first of all hi marlene good to see you hi, <laughs> hi matthew so it, it, again, this it's, is a very tricky question, and, and I think it varies from therapist to therapist, from baby to baby. I, I know some therapists do work with masks and say, yeah, it's fine. Other people work with masks and say it hasn't been so fine, maybe with particular babies, maybe with particular uh, therapists. Uh, of course, you, you, we also need to be aware this can, for some babies, re-stimulate the, the perhaps if the mask was worn by an obstetrician, it can stimulate that very strong fear response. So uh, there are variables in that. And, and personally, I negotiate with the parent. I say, you know, I, I, would you like me to wear a mask? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in my experience, mainly they say, no, we don't wear with, uh, I don't wear a mask. You know, if, if, if I, and I have all other safety precautions around that to, to really minimize the uh, risks there. But also uh, in, in, in the pandemic, I've been doing a lot of work online with parents to really help them to connect in with uh, uh, the baby's story, connecting with what's going on for them. So not working directly with the baby at all. And I mean, it's been very interesting because it's, uh, there's been really beautiful responses. So I, I, think, it, I think there are many variables and in, in each therapist needs to find their own comfort zone within that. But certainly, I, ideally, I, I, I would not wear a mask. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the last question maybe. And we have to close up. Good. We seem to come to the end. Um, I want to thank Matthew for your talk and for your answers. Thank you very much, Matthew. And for the for this first talk in our series, so it is also an opening up of a of a cycle cycle, and um, I hope that we can spread the word, and that we that this is a good thing, working with children, working with babies, working with parents, looking for other ways of relationships and partnership, loving relationship, and also the attitude to our nature to environment and planet. I mean, that's the idea that this core thing is may, maybe meeting other researchers on other fields. And so the next discussion will be with Judith Weaver and Renata Reich from the States. And um, she's the daughter from Eva Reich and Judith Weaver is a well-known body psychotherapist from the States. And they will talk about, about the pioneering work from Eva Reich and their underst her understanding and the, the title is Peace Starts in Utero. I mean, that was a very common f yeah, quote from Eva, so it's what you always said that. I mean, that is this idea we have, when we want to start creating a peaceful environment, we have to start protecting this very, very early life issues, protecting the families and so on. So we want to go on with that. That's the thing, I invite you, please, bring it out into the world. We tape this and we put it into YouTube. And, and I think 
maybe it's a little piece to go on with dealing uh, with these issues and bringing some light in this in this sometimes quite dark periods and of uh, and times we're in. So for me, it's good. It's a kind of hope and optimism to, to share that with you people. We had 100 people. There were many people who wrote they couldn't come in. So next time we have to do it a little bit bigger. But um, thank you for sharing the, the presence. Thank you, Matthew. And I, I want to say, come back if you're interested. And I'm looking forward to do other stuff and other talks. Thank you very much. And see you next time. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Thomas. I mean, to just just say it's been a great pleasure, and really appreciate your generosity and intention in in doing this work. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in and uh, being present. So, and good luck with all the other presentations. Okay, thank you, and bye bye. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you, Matthew and Thomas. Thank